Hello and welcome to another episode of Crypto TV. I'm your host, Ornella Hernandez, here to talk about all things Web3 and crypto. Today, we're going to look at the ups and downs of the crypto market, and we'll talk about a new Layer 1 blockchain that I've been looking into called Partesia. We also have a guest who will talk to us about self-sovereign identity and what that means. So stay tuned. Major cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether are down, altcoins dropped as well, NFT floor prices also plummeted, even popular meme coins started crashing. So while plummeted and crashing sound bad, and people are even using terms like bloodbath to describe the crypto market right now, is it really that bad? Let's get into it. Investors just never seem to be happy. When prices are pumping, we wish we had bought more at lower prices. But when prices are dumping, we get too scared and start to panic. But price corrections are normal people in any market. And seasoned investors know this because they view price corrections as fire sales. So personally, I don't think that crypto is crashing. I think of it as if everything is on sale in the store and it's only for a limited time. So buy what you need before prices go back up because they will. What is going up is the amount of meme coin pre-sales, specifically on the Solana blockchain. This is definitely a new trend that is taking crypto by storm. Pre-sales are something where crypto projects do to try to raise money before launching a token. Basically, investors send money to a random crypto wallet and in return, they hope to receive an airdrop when the token officially launches, in theory. It's like an IOU. Investors take the risk of betting on this meme coin and pray that they sent it to the right address and hope in return that they will receive a free airdrop of tokens once it lists. Well, turns out investors love doing this because Solana-based meme coin presales raised $122 million over the last week, according to crypto sleuth Zach XBT, who posted this chart to show 27 presales that raised 655,000 soul worth $122.5 million. And one of those projects called Slurf saw over $3 billion in trading volume in its first 24 hours of existence, surpassing all Ethereum based exchanges in trading volume. Now, $10 million worth of Solana tokens were supposed to be given to holders via an airdrop, but the founder accidentally burned these and destroyed these tokens. In this tweet, he says that there is nothing he can do to fix this, but that he is sorry. Not sure how much I believe that this was an accident, however. Plus, the slurf drawings are not my favorite. Then there was someone who launched a pre-sale with a plan to use the money to create a token and buy themselves a new Ferrari, the car. And he told people this upfront that he was doing this for a car, but people still gave him around $55,000. It ended up being a joke and the founder actually returned all of the money. But still, it just goes to show you how much people like to gamble because that's what it is. So let's call it for what it is, people. It's gambling. So maybe I'll just set up my own meme coin token launch and have people send me money for a car since it seems to work. And I'll let you know how that goes. This practice of just giving away money towards a meme coin in a FOMO fueled frenzy is incredibly risky, people, and something that may not be for me personally. Plus, I'm also not so sure how it hasn't raised more red flags already due to the legal and ethical questions. And I don't even want to think about the nightmare that the taxes that these founders will have to deal with. I'm sure there will be a crackdown soon. But until then, degen's gonna degen, I guess. So let me know what you guys think about Solana based meme coins or meme coins in general and which ones you've aped into, if any already. Now, on top of meme coin mania, NFT mania is still going strong. I'm sure you've seen that the dog with hat meme sold for $4.3 million. The community even raised $650,000 to take over the Las Vegas sphere for a week. And it all started when a picture of a dog went viral from 2018. And that original picture was turned into an NFT and it just sold for 1,210 ETH which is worth 
$4.3 million at the time of sale. Have you guys bought any whiff? Fun fact, if you didn't know, the dog's name in that photo is Achi. So good boy, Achi. <laughs> now we're going to look into a project called Partesia, which is on my radar because it listed its token this week on major exchanges, including KuCoin, Bitfinex, Gate.io, Bitmart, and Bittrue, just to name a few. Let's start with the basics. Partesia is a new layer one blockchain, so it could supposedly compete with other layer one blockchains like Ethereum, Bitcoin. Let's also look at the website, partesiablockchain.com. It looks a lot more corporate than your average crypto startup website. And the first words we see are the slogan, empowering people, protecting privacy. And if we scroll down a little bit to its mission statement, it states that Partesia allows users to compute all kinds of data while maintaining complete data privacy at rest, in transit, and in use. Okay, so the gist is that while it is a public blockchain, it aims to address the way that users safeguard their digital presence or their internet identities. Especially since we all intentionally or unintentionally share our information online with third parties whenever we interact with any website or sign up for some sort of account using Google or Facebook. So Partizia wants to ensure that any sensitive information remains secure by using privacy preserving protocols and empowering users to take control of their data along the way. It also claims to solve the blockchain trilemma of optimizing for security, scalability and decentralization simultaneously. Whereas Bitcoin and Ethereum run on blockchain networks that prioritize decentralization and security, but not necessarily scalability. Now Algorand is another network that also claims to solve for this trilemma. So this all sounds great, but how do they plan to do this? They're working on something called sharding and a new sharding architecture. If we look at the definition of sharding on Investopedia, it states that Sharding is a database partitioning technique used to enable scalability in blockchains. It also allows them to process more transactions per second by splitting a blockchain network into smaller partitions known as shards. And each shard is distinctive and independent from others. So Basically, this means that instead of the blockchain being a single chain, Partitia uses multiple chains working together to offer a new level of scalability. And this is a little video that they posted where they compare Partitia to other blockchains. This makes me question if a blockchain like Partitia could be an alternative to layer two chains, which were designed and meant to improve scalability on top of layer ones. Now this multi-chain idea is where they got their name for their native token, MPC, which stands for multi-party computation. MPC allows for multiple parties to share data for computing tasks without revealing each other's data. So fun fact, this concept was actually pioneered in the 80s by Partija co-founder Professor Ivan Damgard, who also helped develop key algorithms that make Bitcoin blockchain function. So Partija is meant to support high transaction volumes. Cool. And Partija has a 25 million MPC token airdrop program going on. Now that they've launched the MPC token, they want to reward early adopters of the Partija blockchain with some extra tokens. So if you would like to get positioned for this airdrop, then check out Crypto Twitter for threads on it. There are plenty if you search Partija airdrop. This token is also used to incentivize participants to become full block producers and validators through staking. If you can stake MPC, then you can become a node operator and earn rewards along the way. Of course, to be eligible for the airdrop program, you have to interact with the community. So if you are interested in Partija, then make sure to join the Discord and engage. And if you research it a little bit more, you'll see that Partija is backed by some heavy hitters such as KuCoin Labs, Jump Crypto, and Emergo, just to name a few backers. So in summary, Partija wants to redefine privacy and scalability, and its use cases could span across various sectors, such as compliance or 
self-sovereign identity, SSI, which is a big topic right now, scalability and interoperability, or even secure voting. Now, all these topics are topics that we should care about as members of the Web3 world. So if you are interested in self-sovereign identity, then stay tuned because I have a special guest who's going to shed some light on its importance and exactly what it is when it comes to individuals protecting their data. So stay tuned. Today's guest on Crypto TV is Vikram Anand, who is the co-founder and chief product officer at Hypersign ID. How are you today? I am so good. Thank you very much for calling at Web3 TV. And yeah, excited to be in Dubai. Yeah, welcome to <laughs> Dubai. It's a pleasure to have you on Crypto TV. First off, let's talk about your shirt. Oh, it oh. says your data belongs to you. I love this. So today's topic is going to be data privacy and specifically our digital identities and how that plays a part in keeping our uh, online identities private. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what this means. What does your data belong? What what does that mean to you? So um, the story is this that, uh, you know, everything is monetized so okay so for that you have to understand web 1 web 2 web 3 mm -hmm. so web 1 was like you can just read stuff web 2 was where you can uh, actually enter some data but then web 3 is like you have web 2 there is no control I even though the data is yours but you don't have control of the data so ev we everybody is using our data and uh, collecting data but the data actually belongs to us, right? Whenever we are interacting with a website on an application, we provide the data. They don't give us anything. It's our data. Right. But we do not have control of that. So, so data, that means like our personal information, right? Our, our name, our phone, our email, absolutely. our address, right? That's the data yeah. that we or are even providing. That's one type of data. Other type of data could be your interaction with the service provider. That's where you start uh, giving your behavioral data to them and then they link that behavior data with your actual identity data and then try to circum circulate around you to understand you and and then sell it to other right, right. yeah so for marketing so it's, purposes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> marketing purpose or any other purposes we we don't have any control of that data so this is why we were like okay our t-shirt should say your data belongs to you Although in business terms, it is like everyone talks about this, that uh, it's very difficult to have control of user data, right? Because, but uh, you can see there are now policies coming in, in different uh, areas, like different countries are adopting to policies where, um, you know, data privacy is slowly coming up, mm -hmm. uh, importance of data privacy. And with that also, uh, you know, control of the data, who owns the data and how right, right. data is being going to be managed by the businesses and the service yeah, providers. Like the GDPR so, policies in Europe, for example. Yeah, that's one in India we have now this year, after so long, data protection and privacy bill. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so we thought like to have this as our motto. Okay. Or, I love it. Your data yeah. belongs to you. So talk to me then about HyperSign ID. Mm -hmm and what you guys are, are doing. I know it's a on-chain KYC provider. So what is yeah. the solution that you are providing users? Before on-chain KYC, slightly another story there. Okay. So uh, we started HyperSign as a low, lower level protocol, uh, which can provide self-sovereign identity infrastructure for developers to build different type of use cases. And that is where we are always edu educating students, participating with different uh, government organizations and uh, enterprises, uh, mostly around the education side. But then as a business, we also have to work somewhere in, in some specific field, right? Of so, so we have chosen on-chain KYC as our go-to-market strategy, probably you can say that. Uh, and the reason being, for two years when we were building this, uh, the demand of KYC specifically in the Web3 space wasn't there then. The reason being, there were no, not many RWA real-world asset companies back, 
back in the days when we started 20, 2019 and 2020. But with the help of slowly government um, getting hold of crypto, so they have started to understand how to regulate it. Right. In some form. They can't regulate it fully, but they have started to at least understand it. And hence they are allowing more and more uh, uh, real world businesses to come on chain, but with certain type of regulation there. And okay. to bring these this comes mostly in the category of RWA mm -hmm. and for RWA products to be uh, to launch you need to do KYC without KYC you cannot so which be, so KYC becomes like the main uh, thing there and hence we thought like the demand for KYC is going to grow exponentially now especially okay. in coming bull run okay so, so let's break that down yeah you said a lot of stuff yeah yeah, yeah. so first off self-sovereign identity yes let's look at that term I know it's been around for a couple of years well, let's try and define it a little bit, because are we not self-sovereign individuals already? Yeah. What is the difference between our our, like our in-person identities and our online digital yeah. identities, and why yeah. is the why is there a need to protect our self-sovereignty? In real world, we are self-sovereign because we have some structure that we follow and with which we can implement privacy, but. In, in terms of digital world, we provide our data to someone else and they can manage the way they want. And we don't have control of how long and until when this person can have access to the data. Right. For example, you can just go into another room and I cannot see you. Yeah. Oh, so there is a privacy. That's privacy yeah. But the same thing, uh, what defines me on chain, uh, I mean online, is certain aspects like my characteristic probably my name mm -hmm. uh, where i live all these data collected together and provided to a service provider who stores it now how he is storing it and how long can he store it i do not have control to that and the reason the, the problem here is not us the way internet was built and inter web 2 never thought of that the data belongs to the user Right. They always thought the data belongs to the service provider because you have already provided the data and they can manage the day the way they want. OK. And these providers are websites, websites, Facebook, uh, software, applications, yeah, applications, yeah, applications, mobile okay. application, gaming applications, okay. all these guys, okay. um, governments. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. So but but Internet belongs to everybody. Right. Like when you are building an Internet, it means like it's for the people. Yeah. Well, so the internet by nature is decentralized. Is yes. It not? <laughs> <laughs> so so um, the foundation World Wide Web, Web Consortium, mm -hmm. they come up with like the next version of the internet should have user should prioritize users because users means you and me who are participant there, not prioritizing the businesses or. Uh, entities who collect our data because the data belongs to the user so they should have some control over that right. and right. that's what self-sovereign identity standard was uh, developed by World Wide Web Consortium and there is a working group called W3C and they define the protocol mm -hmm. that hey from now onwards if you are collecting data first you need to bind that data with the user and user st start this data from his own wallet so there is a wallet that user controls just like how bitcoin in case of bitcoin you have a wallet with which you control your banking the same way you will have a wallet or you have a wallet it's already live this these standards with which you control something called data vault and then you provide the data to certain businesses using the vault and you set time-based action uh, access like you can have my name or my address for a certain period of time and then your system should actually wipe it off and I will control uh, you know how long your system can have it so this is a completely rebuilding the internet okay. and for that you need yeah yeah so that is why uh, online self sovereign identity was you know uh, is important okay and yeah. so how how are you leveraging blockchain technology mm -hmm to safeguard this and to promote mm, self-sovereign identities. And would you say that's the same as decentralized identities? Um, slightly, these are two different topics. Okay. Um, actually, self-sovereign identity mostly 
blockchain is used to prove the authenticity of the data. Right. The reason to being, verify. Yeah, yeah, to verify. And why would you need that? Because in Web2 design, you provide the data to the service provider and then he shares the data to different different businesses, right? So he is taking the responsibility that this data is verified by me and I am giving you from my database. So this is already verified data. Mm -hmm. But now imagine the database now goes back to the user. So the service provider doesn't store your data in the new internet. Imagine whenever it happens. Well, it's, the internet is <laughs> constantly evolving, yeah, right? Yeah. So then if there is a other business who wants to access the data that you got verified through certain service provider, let's say you booked, um, you know, you bought this mug from noon okay. and they deliver it to your house, yeah. which means they verified your address. But noon has a new system which is uh, implemented using self-sovereign standards. So noon is storing the verified credential of your address with you in your data vault. Okay, not on their servers. Not on their servers. Now you want to go and purchase something on Amazon, yeah. but Amazon says that, hey, do you already have a verified address credential? How does, does Amazon verify this authenticity of the data? So this is where you need blockchain technology. Okay. We break That's down. That's where HyperSign comes in? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, HyperSign uses blockchain uh, technology and uh, provides authenticity to the data which is stored in the user's data vault okay. or wallet. So HyperSign is currently in um, alpha phase. So it's yeah. soon to launch publicly, right? Yes. Next couple yeah. months? Yes. Okay, that's exciting. So tell me a little bit more about that timeline and that roadmap that you have. Yeah, so um, we, are ex ex we have a couple of partners and um, with which we are launching the KYC uh, product. And we are expecting to go live in April mm -hmm. on one of the partners which was recently announced called Nibiru Chain. Okay, tell me a little bit more about them. Oh yeah, um, so we all belong to, you know, um, crypto is, is having different countries, right? Each blockchain ecosystem is a different country. In so, a way. In yeah, a way, yeah, yeah you, you have to imagine <laughs> that way. So we belong to Cosmos ecosystem. Okay. And Cos so Nibiru also is part, is the new layer one blockchain, part of Cosmos ecosystem, and also uses the similar technology that uh, HyperSign is built, but they have much more, you know, scalability because they focus on, a, on a wide different types of use cases for general purpose blockchain. And we are their KYC partner and self-sovereign identity partner. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's exciting. And then what other partnerships can you talk about? Or I know you have also some collaborations yeah. with, with the governments. Oh, yeah. So these, uh, the, the ones which are announced, I can still talk about it. So um, last year, we, um, we, there is, in India, uh, there is something called Aadhaar, which is our national ID. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we partnered with a company to verify users age without having to give their actual date of birth okay. while buying alcohol and we launched it in oh. India Moto GP that was uh, one of the you know partnerships mm -hmm. um, and then we have like couple of um, uh, um, institutes like engineering institutes with which we are doing some research around different use cases uh, probably this year will uh, the students would be launching these use cases oh yeah. okay okay so you also have some education initiatives yes. as well tell me a little yeah. bit more about that yeah it is mostly around self sovereign identity how because you can see like self sovereign identity is trying to uh, educate uh, developers to rebuild how uh, rethink how they have been taught to build products, right? right? So it needs to go all the way from the engineering. Uh, so, so we are uh, creating different working groups in these institutions. We partner with three institutions so far, okay. and in uh, India? yeah, mostly in India. Um, and but but large scale universities, mm -hmm. more than fifty thousand plus uh, students in each university. You can say because in India is big and a mm -hmm. lot of students, <laughs> yeah, and a lot yeah. of people do engineering. So, so yeah, so we are, we have created working groups where we are educating first and then we convert them into software developers who are aligned towards self-sovereign identity. You can say that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And how do you think our online identities or our digital identities add value to our daily lives? No. Oh. 
a complicated question <laughs> but i mean we use it every day but uh they do add value um in a way because currently you you use you spend most of your time on your phone yeah and you spend less time talking to your friend sitting next to him or or you know people around you apart from your workmates that's one thing because you spend but other than that you spend most of your time and you are interacting which means your identity is getting created multiple times and if i don't take steps to add value mm. to protect that i identity which means that it is going to be uh, uh crazy in some time look uh, you are sitting in india uh, sorry in dubai but if you look at india india is not yet not even 60% of indian population yet have uh, mobile phones yeah. which be, and the and the uh, and the hacks and uh, you know uh, data breaches are going crazy right now so if we do not uh, take steps towards protecting the data when the 100% of the population goes online mm -hmm. it's going to go crazy because we are spending more time online now than offline so i i do feel that the digital our digital identity actually adds lot of value because <laughs> everything every business now wants to verify you digitally rather than uh, for ease of use or whatever is the reason yeah yeah so okay so any tips that you have for our viewers out there um, to protect their individual data yeah so uh, i mean just be mindful um whenever there there are very simple things passwords are not good so <laughs> so even if the app says you can implement 2fa second factor authentication that's the first step to do so because without uh, 2fa just think like your data will be breached because every type of uh, password phrase that you can remember um it's already hacked or you know brute forced <laughs> so i feel device based uh authentication is still secure because that goes through your fingerprint uh so which biometrics. is biometrics yeah so so always implement second factor that's one always be mindful what data are you sharing with whom so self sovereign uh, teaches us that uh you know when someone is asking you passport he might ask the passport only one part of the passport for example maybe an address so try to be mindful about it like he is asking me address but i am giving him the passport he has everything what i uh, about me now right like so i would just give him the passport uh, the address if possible so mindful about sharing data and mindful about protecting your data so simple steps like implement 2fa and use stronger uh, passwords if possible <laughs> yeah okay okay yeah, that's good it. advice thank you and one last question yeah if you could have Elon Musk face to face with you in a conversation okay <laughs> what would you like to say to him when it comes to the topic of self sovereign identity because i know with yeah. x he was trying to have some better verification process right an authentic authentication process when it comes to our profiles so what do you think you would say to him if you had him face to face <laughs> i would tell him to uh, move uh, twitter identity into a data vault system because i feel twitter can be to uh, twitter is actually uh, conceptualized in a way that it belongs to the user in my opinion because that's what twitter is trying to portray mm -hmm. uh, if he can do that 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 would be like the the biggest um non government based uh, implementation of self sovereign identity and i do feel twitter can do that Okay. Uh, I, Elon can do it. He's a radical <laughs> guy, <laughs> and and it won't affect much to the uh, Twitter users, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology is advanced enough, so because we are using Twitter every day, right. you know, and well, especially in the crypto, yeah, Web three blockchain yeah, right. world. So. Yeah. All right. That's all the time we have for today, Vikram. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. Thank you very much for inviting me. Everyone make sure to follow Vikram and Hypersign ID and stay tuned for the rest of Crypto TV. Bitcoin is currently trading at $67,281. Ether's price is at $3,544 today. 
Sol is up nearly 16% this week, with a price of $190 today. And Partija's MPC is trading at 55 cents, up from the 30 cents after launch on March 19th. And that is all for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something. Make sure to follow Vikram, and especially if you're interested in learning more about self-sovereign identity, then check out Partija. And I'll see you guys next time for Crypto TV.